Good morning, family. How's everybody doing today? Hey, how about a shout out for those Lubbock Cooper Pirates? Man, still got the ball rolling, man. And then my alma mater played for state yesterday, came up a little short, but the Lubbock Christian Eagles went to state yesterday, played for it. First time they played in a while, but uh, them Pirates, arg, they're still, they're still on a roll, man. And so... Uh, going to go to Abilene next Saturday and support our boys, watch them play over there, and hopefully uh, beat those Bearcats out of Alito. And uh, here's, that's, that's a big task, but let me tell you something. Any team can be beaten on any day. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the, the, the size of the dog. It matters about the fight in the dog. Come on, I need some help in here. And so y'all be pulling for our boys, man. What a big thing for those young men. I'm excited for them. There's nothing better. When you play in December, you remember, and, and that's a fact, you know. How would you know? I don't. I just would like to have known what it would be like to play uh, in December. Actually, we made it to semifinals in state, and, and I watched uh, them play a very good game. Uh, but we're, uh, we're in a series on uh, worship, and it's called uh, Here as in Heaven. And today, I want to talk to you about God's desire. And we have a God who is... Uh, totally self-sufficient, he's self-existent, he's self-sustaining, but in the midst of all of that, the question therein lies, does he have a desire? And if he does have a desire, what would it be? What does that look like? And I, if you don't spend a lot of time with me, you may not know this about me, but I'm a very bottom line person, very bottom line person. Um, when I'm talking to people, I like for them to get to the bottom line. <laughs> I like to at least to know there's going to be a lot of bottom line before Jesus comes. Come on. So, am I the only one? And, and even, even with my staff, my staff comes in my office and I'm like, be brief, be brilliant, be gone. You know, you know that's, those three things, you're going to be solid. And you say, well, there, there's only, let me take, there's, there's two types of people in the world. There are bottom line people and there's beat around the bush people. And if you don't know which one you are, you are beat around the bush. That's, that's who you are. Because all bottom line people know who they are. And, and it offends my wife and my staff had to get to know me because they'll send me this text message that's like a book. And I'll be like, okay. <laughs> and then the next day they come, Pastor, are you upset with me? No. Well, I just wrote you this extended text message, and your response was, okay. Okay. Well, I didn't know if you read it or not. I read it, but you didn't ask for it. You gave me information, and I didn't feel like my information to you was okay. And so Trish, she'll send me this whole list. Same thing with my wife. She said, da 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 Got it. Well, what do you mean, got it? Like, there's no, you putting your own inflection in there, girl. There's no emotion that got it. Got it means got it. <laughs> I'm the only one. Y'all don't have those people in your life that are like, I'm offended. How are you going to get through offended through, through words on a piece of paper? There's no exclamation. There's no question mark. It's okay. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> are you with me on this? And so, and, and, and the reason I say that is because, does God have a bottom line? And if he does, what's, what's his bottom line and what's the bottom line of the Bible or what's his desire? And the best way to find out what God's desire might be is to go all the way back to the beginning because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you know that? Amen? He doesn't change. He said, I'm the Lord God and I do not change. And so I got three points today. We're not going to be here long, I promise you. The first service was like, shoot, we got time to go make brunch. They're going, well, we're on it, you know. I'm not going to be long today, but I got a lot to say in a short time, and I hope that you leave this place better than the way you came. So if you're a note taker, here's number one. God made me from him. If you ever want my notes, you can go to YouVersion Bible app. All of my notes, all of my scriptures are in there every week. YouVersion, hit the more button. After you hit a more, hit events. After you hit events, the worship center is right there. So uh, God made me for him, or another way would say it is God made me out of him. Now, what I'm about to say, if we have any English teachers here, uh, what I'm about to say is not grammatically correct. I already know that. 
Okay, I already know. So I don't need no email to he don't know what he's saying and stuff. It's not grammatically correct, but it's theologically correct. Okay, so watch this. When God wanted something in the beginning, he spoke to what he wanted it to be made out of or made from. He also spoke not only of what he wanted it to come out of, but to what he wanted it to be sustained by and what he wanted it to return to. Now, I said when God was creating and making, and let me unpack that for you a little bit today, because many people have never understood that God created some things and God made some things. When you create something, you form something out of nothing. When you form something, you make something out of something else. Now, that my, what I'm about to say is going to hurt somebody's feelings, guarantee you. Going to disappoint somebody. But here's the truth. You don't actually create anything. <laughs> you don't create anything. You make things. Now, you may have some creative, creative tendencies, some creative abilities, because we are made by a creative God. Come on, somebody. We're made by a creative God, but we really can't create something like God creates things. Like, like we can't make something out of nothing. And if you can make something out of nothing, you're called a pot stirrer. Yeah. <laughs> I know there's some people getting tagged. Right? He talking to you. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay. What do you mean, Todd? I mean, so if I came to your house and, and you make pottery and, and you say, Pastor Todd, let me show you something. Look at this vase. I created it. And I'm going to bust your bubble. and say, no, you didn't. You didn't create that. You, you made the vase. You started with clay and you molded it into a vase. You made it. You did not say, let there be vase and there was a vase. Are you tracking with me now? But somebody did and his name was God. God said, let there be light and there was light. Now let me show you how powerful and how awesome your God is. If, if, if we walk over to that switch on the back of the room and we hit off, all the lights are going to go off. If we hit on, all the lights come on because they are sustained by electricity. Electricity gets put into here. It gets turned into energy. Energy keeps the lights on, right? God said, let there be light. Go back and read the book for yourself. The sun or the moon hasn't even been made yet. If there's no sun and there's no moon and there's no stars, where is light coming from? That's how powerful your God is, is that whatever he says, it has to happen. So if you're here this morning and you've been given a prophetic word and it hasn't come to pass yet, let me tell you, whatever is opposing it, when God says, let it has to happen, darkness was over the earth. God said, let there be light. And it was. If you believe that, give God a good shout of praise. I got to I got to flip a switch. In order to get some light, God just had to say a word. In other words, if God said, Todd, that is an awesome red shirt you have on, immediately this shirt would become what he said because God is a man and he is not a man and he doesn't know how to lie. So whatever he speaks to, whatever he says has to come to pass. Isn't that a good word? So he said, let there be light. We didn't do it that way. So God created some things and he made some things. So when he made some things, he spoke to what he wanted it to come from, to what he wanted it to be sustained by, and, and, and what it would return to. Let me show you this in the Bible. It's very important. I, I want you to stick with me. He said, where is this crazy man going? Stick with me. Genesis 1.11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed. Uh, yield seed. <laughs> and the truth... My head's going in a hundred million ways right there with that herb. And <laughs> There's some people like, praise the Lord. <laughs> Pastor just told me to go start a pot farm. That's what he told me right there. And you're going to go home and say, Bye. he read it. It comes from the earth. So does poison ivy, fool, but you don't go around rolling in it. <laughs> don't be trying to trip up the Bible. Somebody going, I'm coming to church with a bong next week. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seeds, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. 
So God is saying, let the earth bring forth. He said, let, and all these things, if you go back and read creation, he said, let. In other words, whatever's opposing what I'm saying has to be manifested. That's a bad truth all by itself. Let there be light. And in essence, what he was saying is light come forth. And in this sentence, he's saying, earth, bring forth plants and trees and grass. Now, God did not say, let there be trees. He said, earth, bring forth trees. Why? Because he wanted trees to come from dirt, to be sustained by dirt, and to go back to dirt. And you're going to find out in just a minute why that's so important. It's not just important. It's extremely important that you understand this truth. Verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. Right there, you can see fish are sustained by water. Verse 24, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. Animals came from dirt, they're sustained by dirt, and they go back to dirt. Why am I making such a big deal of this? Let me say it one more time before I get into this truth. When God wanted something, pay attention to those words. When he wanted something, he spoke to what he wanted it to come from, to be sustained by and to return to. Why, Todd, do you keep hammering this? Why is this such a big deal? Because when God wanted us, he spoke to himself. When God wanted us, he spoke to himself. Remember, he spoke to and, and what he's making it to come from and to be sustained by and to go back to. Verse 26, then God said, let us make, not create. Let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness. So we came from God, we're sustained by God, and we go back to God. Are you catching what I'm trying to tell you? That's his plan this morning. And you may say, hey, 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 look here. I ain't the smartest pencil in the box, sharpest pencil in the box. But hold on, because the Bible says God formed man out of dust of the earth. So didn't we come from dirt? And aren't we sustained by dirt? And don't we go back to dirt? No, watch this. God made my body out of dirt. My body came from dirt. It's sustained by dirt. It goes back to dirt. But my spirit came from God. It's sustained by God and goes back to God. That's his plan. My body is sustained by dirt, by fruit, by meats, not vegetables, by ice cream and little Debbie. Come on, somebody. Woo! We're sustained by I'm going to prove it to you. Cows eat grass, cows eat milk, or cows make milk. Ice cream comes from milk, therefore ice cream is healthy and is God's will for my life. I can't prove it in the Bible, but, you know, it just sounds good. Because when you really think about it in that light, ice cream is just processed salad. And let the church say, I'm all about it. That's good, right? If I don't know that, I'd put a bigger offering in today. That's what I'd have done. <laughs> Plants come from dirt. They're sustained by dirt. They go back to dirt. But what would happen if a plant said to the dirt, I'm out of this. I'm pulling out, and I'm going to make it on my own, and I'm going to do this by myself. That plant would die, right? Well, man said to God, I can do this by myself. I'm pulling out. And I'm going to make it on my own. And God said, the day you do that, you're going to die. Now, their bodies didn't die because their bodies came from dirt. They're sustained by dirt and they go back to dirt. But death entered and man began to die. In our lifetime, remember, they used to live over 900 years. Methuselah, you go back, they used to live over 900 years. And, and, and our lifetime has gotten shorter uh, physically, but it was our spirit that died right then. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have a life and that they may have life more abundantly. We weren't even, I want you to catch this, you weren't even alive 
until you accepted Jesus as your savior. Are you catching it? You never really became alive until you got saved. So if you haven't accepted Christ, you're still dead. But God's will is that you not only have life, but have more abundant life. Now, abundant life, people say, I get that in heaven. Abundant life's not in heaven. You'll have it when you get to heaven. Abundant life is for now. And abundant life isn't a house with, with 20 bedrooms and, and 18 bathrooms and four-car garage. Sometimes abundant life is everybody else's kid at the daycare got chicken pox, but your kid didn't get chicken pox. And everybody else is running fever, but your kid's not running fever. And everybody else that got hired before you is getting laid off, but somehow you've been there three weeks and you still got a job because I serve a God that knows how to make a way when there seems to be no way. It doesn't make sense, but that's just who he is. He's the way maker. Come on, somebody. He's the miracle worker, isn't he? And so we weren't even alive until he redeemed us. So God made me from him. Here's point number two. God made me like him. God made me like him in his image. Keep that in mind as we answer this question. If God has a desire, what's his desire? Now, I want you to think about this. God made somebody just like he is, a man named Adam. And you got to remember what we're about to read happened before sin. It happened before the fall of man. Um, Adam was perfect. He had no bad thoughts. He had no bad desires. But God makes a, a replica of himself and then the one he makes that is exactly like him has a desire. You ever thought about that? Adam had a desire. And we're trying to figure out if God has a desire, and if he does, what is it like? But God made a man just like him, and that man had a desire. Let's pick it up here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. So Adam gave names to all the cattle to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now, I want you all to think about how amazing Adam was. He starts doing, he starts out like a bang when he's naming these animals. Come on, he's busting out like rhinoceros. <laughs> okay, Adam, I see you. Hippopotamus, ooh. Orangutan, what? What in the world's orangutan? Tarantula, okay. Centipede. Black. Bird. Blue. Bird. But I mean, he started out like a house of fire, a giraffe. And then he comes down, black bird. That's, the, that's a proof that men have a short attention span. <laughs> Ladies, now he ain't trying to ignore you. He, is, he has gone as far as he can mentally go. <laughs> Adam was perfect. And look, here, look how he fell out. <laughs> Adam fell out. He is not ignoring you. That's as much as he can go at one time. Because after he got exhausted, look, he went to sleep. Took a nap. The Bible says he couldn't find a helper comparable to him. Comparable is the root word of, of companion. They have the same root. And why would the Bible say that? Why, why would it say that? He said he named the animals, but while he's naming the animals, he couldn't find one that would be a companion. Why did he say that? That's, that's, that's kind of odd. Because it's, it's possible that Adam who was just like God because he has not sinned. Are you tracking with me? He has not failed. But, but, but I think he may, he may have went to God and, and says, hey, let me tell you something. First off, this garden you made, top shelf. <laughs> you did a good job. I'm going to tell you, I don't know if anybody else in the garden came by and told you because I know it's just me and you. <laughs> but I want you to know that I know that you did a really good job. It's a good place, a good place to raise a family and stuff if, if, if maybe I had one. But it's just me, and, and I got this desire. Now, I don't really know even how to express my desire. I don't even know what 
I, I got this feeling, and I don't really even know how to tell you about this feeling, but, 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 but there's something in me that wants more. There's something in me that, that, that has a desire, and I don't know what it is, but it's something. And I think God said something like, well, Adam, why don't you go out and over here on this hill and sit there, and why don't you name all the animals? And while you're naming all the animals, why don't you see if you like any of them? Okay. That, that's just what I'm thinking. That's just, because the Bible says he couldn't find one. If you can't find one, that means you had to be looking for something. Are, are, it's just common sense. He had to be looking for something. And it says there was not found. And the reason it was not found is because it hadn't been created yet. And while he's naming the animals, he goes to sleep. And God takes a rib out. And he forms this new animal called Eve. A beast like never before. <laughs> unknown to mankind. And Adam wakes up and he's been naming the animals and he's tuckered out because he's already on Bluebird and Blackbird and he wore out. And he, he's over there and he... Hey, I ain't never seen an animal like up in here. I have not seen that. Whoa, man. And that's where we get the word woman from right there. No, because it means out of man, okay? And, and, and Adam says, this is amazing. God came out of Adam. Eve came out of man. Out of man, I'm telling you, God made us from him. Out of God, Eve shows up, and it's not in the Bible. Can I just throw something in there that I think? Because I think when Adam seen Eve, <laughs> I think it's not in the Word, but I think this is the first time you ever hear somebody say, Woo, won't he do it? Won't he do it? And Eve hollered back, said, won't he will? No, he didn't do that. <laughs> That's just my interpretation of the Garden of Eden. That's all I know. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Had his tambourine out and everything. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how good God's been. I'm going to tell you how good God's been. Woo! The weather started getting tough. The tiny ship was getting lost. Talking about the love boat. Anyway, let me get back in here. <laughs> Y'all don't remember that? Because <laughs> he helped Gilligan get off the island. Huh? <laughs> he helped Joshua in the battle of Jericho. Huh? Ooh, he got Daniel out the lines then. And, let me get back to this. <laughs> and he got Gilligan off the island. Anyway, so <laughs> how did God know? Watch me. How did God know that the only thing that would satisfy the desires of Adam's heart was a bride. Why didn't God just give him a football? Or a motorcycle? Or a new gun? Or a fast car? Or Sunday NFL ticket? <laughs> with a recliner and a remote? If somebody ain't amen the whole time they've been at your pace. That boy's good. I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> How did God know? Are, are, are you with me on this? How did God know that the only thing that would satisfy the desires of Adam's heart would be a bride? How did he know that? Because God has the same desire. God has the same desire. Remember, sin isn't on the scene yet. So Adam's desire is pure. And he wanted a bride, and God knew that because God had the same desire. God created you in his image, which means he created you with a will. And how do you know that? Because God has a will, and love is a choice. And, and, and when you talk about a companion, you want somebody to choose to love you, not to have to love you, right? You want them to choose you. And, and, and God could have made us all robots, but there's no love in being a robot. And he knew that we would have to choose to love him because love is a choice. 
and God made me from him, so I came from him, I'm sustained by him, and I go back to him. Now, then he made me in his image, so I have the same desire he has. And he has a desire for a bride, and we're talking about love being a choice. So here's the last point. God made me to love him. God made me to love him. Well, Pastor Todd, you just said that love is a choice. It, it is, but God made me to love him. We're talking about living in his presence and being here on earth as it is in heaven. And the best way, the best way to live in God's presence is to live a lifestyle of praise and worship. To live a lifestyle of praise and worship. And, and maybe you've never con connected the dots this way, but worship is just expressing love. When, when you praise him, you are expressing love to him out of your innermost beings. And, and you have to know anytime, this is a great promise and a great truth, anytime that you give whatever you give God, you're always going to receive it back. And here's the great, when it comes back, it comes down, pressed down, shaking together and running over. We give it one way, but God says, I'm going to multiply it when I give it back to you. That's a good word right there, man. And what are you saying? It's just his nature. So when I say, God, I love you, he says, I love you too. When I say, God, you're my best friend, he says, you're my best friend unless Todd's with you and then Todd's my best friend. <laughs> you're my best friend. God's greatest desire, I want you to hear me. God's greatest desire is you and that you would choose to love him. And one of the, the most primary expressions of love is worship. It's worship. And, and, and there's a phrase or theme that is constantly repeated in the Bible over and over again. And when something's done over and over again, I think it must be pretty important for us to pick up, right? Right? So, like, you read the Bible where it says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, and stuff like that. The only triple repetition when it comes to the attributes of God is holy, holy, holy. So, God says holiness is something really special to me, amen? So, when you see something over and over again, God's trying to say something to us. So, I want to show you a couple things, and you tell me if you can figure out what the pattern is of what God's trying to say to his church, okay? Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 26, 12, I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Jeremiah 7, 23, but this is what I command them, saying, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Jeremiah eleven four. 4, so you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah 24, 7, then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Jeremiah 30, verse 22, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah 31, 33, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 20, that they may walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel 14, 11, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but they may be my people, and I may be their God. Ezekiel 36, 28, that you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Ezekiel 37, 23, they shall not defile the themselves anymore with idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with other, any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Hosea 2.23, speaking specifically to Gentiles, then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people people and they will say you are my God Zechariah 8 8 speaking specifically to the Jews I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God Zechariah 13 9 they will call upon my 
name and I will answer them and I will say this is my people and each one will say this is the Lord my God. 2 Corinthians 6 16 I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Hebrews 8 10 for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Revelation 21 1 now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also there was no more sea then I saw John I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God It started that way. It finishes this way. Are you, did you catch it? God wants you to be his people and he wants to be your God. That's the theme. I hope you're catching it this morning. It's hard to miss it when it's that clear. If you leave here like, I don't know what he's saying. Here's your sign. <laughs> you can't miss it. God's in love with you. Pastor Todd, I've done a lot. Oh, yeah. Me too. God's in love with you. God knew how we'd betray him. God knew what we would do wrong. And he still chose us. I'm going to prove this to you even further as I get ready to close. For a moment, I want you to pretend. I want you to use your holy imagination. And I want you to pretend we know it didn't happen in the Bible, so I don't want anybody to call me a heretic. I would just for a moment go with me. I want you to pretend that Adam wasn't with Eve when she ate the fruit that day. And if, if, if Adam wouldn't have been there, then a conversation like this would have happened. God would have had to go over to Adam and say, son, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your bride has sinned. And she's going to die. Now we know that that conversation never happened, right? We know that. But a conversation like that did happen with a man named Jesus. Because when we talk about his desires, what do you get somebody who has everything? You're out shopping now. Everybody's doing the Christmas season. What do you get somebody that has everything? What could your, what could God the Father give to God the Son that he didn't have? A bride. And a conversation had to have taken place. And God the Father had to go to his son and say, son... I've got something to tell you. I've got, dad's got some really bad news. Some really bad news. But your bride has sinned. And because of that, she's going to die. And I don't know about you, but I can imagine Jesus just being heartbroken. And I can imagine just holding his head in his, his hands and say, but dad, I, I, I don't want her to die. I, I don't want her to die. And then, then I think the father said something like this. But son, somebody has to pay the price. Somebody has to die. And I think at that moment, this is this, 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 this just me. I think at that moment, Jesus raises his head back up. I think he wipes all the tears from his face. I think he looks his father in his eyes and he says, then let it be me because I don't want my bride to die I don't want my bride to suffer let it be me so that she can live I choose her over me I choose you and I choose you and I choose you
and I choose you. But you have no clue of what I've done. Doesn't matter what you've done, what you've done is not who you were created to be. You were fearfully and wonderfully made in your mother's womb. That purpose didn't die when you messed up. You don't die for a messed up project that you can't redeem. And people all the time sell things. We sell things. And we say, I'm going to sell this car, and, and, and I think I can get $20,000 for this car. And people are like, you're never going to get $20,000 for that car. But you took time, you restored it, and you put it back together. The seats are back to the original seats, and the paint job is back to the... You took it all the way back down to the frame and built it all the way back up. And, and so you know the intricacies, and you know the hard work, and, and you know everything that went in to putting that car back together and so only the person that made the car or built the car can determine the price so you have decided that in your life that that the amount of value on your life is not a whole lot because of what all you've done and how you've blown it and maybe people have even come in and out of your life and said you're never going to make you're just like your daddy your daddy was a drunk and you're going to be a drunk you're just like your mama your mama was nothing but a liar and that's all you're ever going to be is a liar you'll, you'll never be anything good and so you begin to believe the lie that there is no value the only problem with that is the one that made you when it came time to, to, for him or you he said, wait, 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 wait. I know the value. I know the value. And I choose me to die so that they can live. But you know how messed up and how flawed they're going to be? I know everything about them and I still choose them over myself. Because isn't that what we're called to be as husbands? There's nothing I won't do in this world for my wife. There are things I'll do for my wife and my son that I won't do for anything or anybody else. Especially when Hunter's a baby. Go change that diaper. Oh, bless the Lord. <laughs> but it was my kid. I'll do anything for my kid. When Trish and I were coming up, we're planting this church. Man, we didn't have a whole lot to go around. Seven people. You start out with seven people, you ain't got money. Just So you make sure everybody else gets to eat before you eat. I'm not telling a story to some of you. Some of you know exactly what I, Some of you went to bed hungry last night so your kids could have something to eat. And people say, oh, what a great sacrifice. And you're like, there was no sacrifice involved. It was love. The Bible says that he endured the cross for the love. For the love of you. He went through that pain. And he determines your value was worth his life. And here's the crazy thing about it. You think about the billions of people that have walked on this planet and that have died and those that are yet to be born and that will walk into His sacrifice was enough to pay for every one of those people. That's how much value is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has shed that so that you can be redeemed. And you say, oh, it must be the same value as gold. Gold has no value in heaven. They make asphalt out of it. Has no value. It's valuable to us, but God says, I'm just going to make streets out of that. But when I made you, I made you to be sustained by me. Come from me. Sustained by me, and I made you to return to me. Whatever your hookup is, whatever your habit is, whatever your mindset is, today's a good day to get married. And he's never going to be embarrassed that you're his bride. Some punk men, oh, I'm going to preach it like I feel it. Some punk men will fall out of love when a woman puts on a little weight. And who are you weighing 400 pounds judging people? Had to get rid of your jeans because all you can fit in is in sweats. 
Y'all not ready for me. And your wife went through the birthing process so that you could have a child and now she's not as attractive to you as she once was. Are you kidding me? Are you crazy? God saw you all swole up with cankles. God saw you with that moon face. God saw you filthy. He saw you dirty. He saw you wallowing. He saw the needle in your arm and the can in your hand and he still decided you are worth it. And I'll never be ashamed of you. If you'll never be ashamed of me, I'll never be ashamed of you. And there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb where God presents us to himself and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. His desire is you. His desire is you. You don't know my story. I, I, if I did, I couldn't change it. That's why I don't preach about what Todd can do. Todd can't do anything. I'm telling you about somebody that can redeem everything. He doesn't make some things new. He makes all things new. And today is a great day to have a wedding party. I want every head bowed this morning. I want my altar workers to come. Heads are bowed. No one's looking around. I want you to catch this. This is so important for you to understand just how vitally important you are to God. How important you are to Jesus that, that he would die so that you could live and, and, and how much he wants to marry you and for you to live happily ever after. And the good news is God has worked out all the details so that that can happen by grace and not by works. It's by grace this morning. Jesus has taken care of all of our sins so that we can say yes to him today and live happily ever after. So in that, with heads bowed, I want you to understand that, that maybe when we take communion and, and, and maybe when we do worship and maybe when we read the word and, and maybe when we do prayer, maybe that that is so much more important than you could possibly ever imagine. Expressing your love to God may be so much more important than you think. So the question is, with heads bowed, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? God, what are you saying to me right now? Ask him. Ask him, he'll tell you. Today, it's time to let your value be determined by someone that truly knows your value. The one who made you. The one created you. The one that would rather die for you than to live eternity without you. And his name is Jesus.